All right. Well, we got about three minutes. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ryan Stevens. I teach eighth grade social studies um, in the Olathe School District in Kansas. Uh, and in Kansas, that's uh, 19th century US history. So we basically take constitution through uh, roughly the Spanish-American War-ish. Uh, kind of depends on what we are able to get done, which uh, is a little bit different this year. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, I see Melissa said hello in the chat. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa Humphreyville. I teach sixth grade earth science over at Blue in Blue Valley at Leewood Middle. Okay, glad to have you. Um, I'm Callie Opie. I'm a senior at Emporia. All right. Glad to have a student teacher here, excited to learn awesome. a little bit about it. Uh, all right, looks like Celia is uh, joining us from Plantation, Florida. That's, that's wow. This is like the furthest like chat I've ever had uh, with uh, teachers about gamification. That, that's really cool. And uh, Jim's joining us from Texas. We're, we're all over the map here. That's, that's great uh, to see. Um, so, you know, I mean, we're kind of all in different uh, places, I'm sure. Um, I'll share a little bit kind of where I'm at with gamification. And then uh, if you're new to gamification or if you have done it a little bit and want to learn more, I'll let you guys kind of share out where, where your experience is with it. And we'll kind of keep this pretty free form and open. Um, this is my third year gamifying my class. Um, it's a full year gamified experience uh, with an Indiana Jones theme uh, that we do in my class. Um, so we've got a uh, leaderboard, experience points, items, badges, um, what I call fortune and glory quests, um, and um, boss battles and squad challenges and class uh, challenges. So a whole kind of nine yards of, of everything. It's a, it's a fully immersive uh, experience as we go. Um, so if you've kind of got your own kind of spin on it, feel free to share out and we'll, we'll just kind of keep it low key here. We've only got about six members, so it should be easy to just chat. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Hey, Elizabeth's joining us. Good to see you, Elizabeth. Uh, all right. So Jim, uh, I love the handle, by the way, Ed Tech Jim. That, that, that's awesome. I love that Twitter handle. Um, digital learning coach recently retired. Um, wow. You're like uber tech guy. I, I, I like that. That's, that's awesome. That, that's great, great stuff uh, to share. Um, it changes daily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It, it definitely does. I, but, I, but I love seeing that you're Google because Google is my jam. Like I love thing, all things Google. So I, I'm very, very excited to, to see that. Um, right. Looks like, uh, all right. So Elizabeth, uh, feel free to introduce yourself to us so we can. Okay, so uh, I am Elizabeth Johnson. I teach Spanish at Oleza West, and I'm teaching AP Spanish and also Spanish for heritage, Spanish heritage students. So that is what I do. Awesome, great, glad to have you uh, with us. Uh, I, I, I see, you know, awesomeness expert Josh Stock here with us too. That, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> of course it is, of course it's awesome. It's a little redundant, but. Um, so if you haven't introduced yourself yet, feel free to do so. If you'd rather do it in the chat, I can announce it to everybody, or if you want to just share out. Uh, we've got a few people here, so fire away. Uh, my name is Summer. I teach Quest over at SFT with the awesome Mr. Stock. I learned that from him. Uh, I'm Josh Stock. Uh, don't believe the hype. I'm not as awesome as they say. I teach sixth grade language arts at Santa Fe Trail. Um, I'm Sydney Gully. I am a student intern, actually, at Northview Elementary in Olathe. So nice to see y'all. Yeah, we've got uh, quite the quite the crew here. Uh, I see uh, Amy Walker's here from uh, Summit Trail. Uh, awesome, awesome seventh grade uh, teacher that I get to work with. Uh, so that's 
great, great to see. Um, I'm Lori Greenfield. I'm from Lawrence, uh, and I teach at Prairie Park Elementary in Lawrence. Okay. All right. And uh, looks like Ariel's joining us too. And uh, and Jennifer uh, from Texas. I saw your response on Flipgrid. That's awesome that you're that you're with us here. So we got a couple people from Texas joining us. So I, I I pointed out my daughter's going to Summit next year. So I said, hey, there's two teachers at Summit. So. Oh. Well, hey. Say hi. I'm going to SFT. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we're excited to have everybody here. Wow, this is a lot of people in this session. I, I wasn't quite certain we were going to have this many. That, that's really cool. I'm glad. Um, so I kind of shared a little bit about my game for those who are uh, kind of just joining us. Um, I, this is my third year of gamification. It's a full year gamified class with an Indiana Jones theme. Um, we've got items, badges, a leaderboard, experience points, uh, group challenges, class challenges, um, side quests, which I call fortune and glory quests. And, um, you know, just kind of almost the whole nine yards when it comes to, to gamification, kind of almost every element that I've found and pulled from different sources I've tried to bring into the game uh, in some way. So um, this, is, this is so, so uh, great to see everybody in here. Um, so I've, I've kind of, the chat's open. Obviously, if you've got questions, feel free to type them in the chat with a lot of people here. Sometimes it might get a little bit crowded and, and noisy if everybody tries to talk at the same time. So if you're a little unsure about that, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll bring the question out to everybody uh, as we go. Um, so I posted an initial question out there and I'll type this in the chat too so people can follow along here. So uh, kind of just my first question is uh, kind of what does uh, everyone think uh, when they think gamification. So fire away and I'll mute myself and listen. So when I think of uh, gamification, I think of like challenges, just ways to engage kids in a new way and provide opportunities for them to um, challenge themselves and challenge each other. I think it's a fun way to do an assessment on something that we've learned in class, maybe make some kind of a game or a challenge of it, and then I can see where they're at with their learning. I think of it as a way to be able to engage both males and females since the research shows that males will not um, let themselves down in, in um, Let's flip that. Males won't let down their team and females don't want to let down themselves. So it kind of brings both of that into a little bit of competition, which is also a real life thing. I, I like that idea uh, about kind of this idea of competition. And I think sometimes we, we lose, when we talk about competition, it, it can go kind of into a negative realm. I think we've all kind of seen that sometimes in classrooms where competition pulls us into that just winner take all uh, win at all costs and dismiss everybody else. Whereas um, when I try to design a game, I want it to be a collaborative competition. So yes, you may want to win individually, but there's also a, uh, a desire to win for your group or is desire to win for your class. So the competition has layers to it uh, as we go. So we've got a, a few people who are kind of uh, new to the game. We've got a, um, a, a student teacher um, and a uh, student uh, intern. So we've kind of got some people who are really kind of new to the idea of education. So gamification is, is really kind of a neat way to, as people have mentioned, engage your students uh, in a, a task. Um, the biggest thing I've found out of it is that engaged students are uh, not an issue when it comes to classroom management. So if you can create an engaging and an immersive experience, you've done 90% of the work when it comes to a classroom management situation. And if you've got engaged students, you're not sitting there spending all of your time handling all those behavior problems or chasing down X, Y, and Z. It's literally they're engaged in, in this task. So um, not kind of seeing where everybody, kind of seeing we're all over the map here. Uh, I thought let's kind of work through the basics of it. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of layering a gamified um, setup and 
Uh, if it gets to be a little overwhelming, don't worry. We've got a couple other sessions if you want to come back in uh, tomorrow or Sunday and we can maybe uh, work through what you've thought through. I'll be happy to talk. I could talk for hours about this. Josh knows that me all too well to know I can talk for hours about this. But uh, one of the first things I think of when I think of a gamification is starting with a theme. And theme is everything. Um, and so my theme is Indiana Jones. Uh, I love Indiana Jones. I am a nerd. I've got, you know, hat, jacket, satchel, the whole nine yards. Uh, I dress up as Indiana Jones in class sometimes. It's a, it's a whole thing for me. But I've also found that if I can get 13 and 14 year olds excited about a movie from the 1980s, uh, I've done a lot of the work. And that's kind of what it is, is it takes that idea and that theme and figures out how we can layer it over there. The beauty part of theme that I will share with you is anything, anything you are passionate about can be a theme. So I want you to think for a little bit here. I'm going to give you kind of an exercise with this as we kind of go through this um, is I want you to think about something you are passionate about. If, if it's reality TV shows, um, if it is uh, Indiana Jones or Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter, doesn't matter what it is. If you are passionate about it, I want you to think about how can that be a theme um, in my classroom? And there is no judgment here. So you can be as, your biggest guilty pleasure ever out there. If you are somebody who is a sucker for um, keeping up with the Kardashians and can find a way to make that a theme in class, I would love to see it. So uh, take a minute to kind of think about it and see if you can bring that in. If you want to share it in the chat, if you want to share it out loud, uh, that would be awesome. And we can kind of just bounce ideas off each other. And then we'll go from theme to uh, some of the other elements here. And we can kind of work through how to help build a game uh, as we go. All right, so we got some, some cool ones. We got Pac-Man games, uh, Harry Potter, uh, yes, The Masked Singer. Okay, I, I like that. Um, Batman traveling, uh, just in general, I like that. <laughs> Passionate about M&Ms, I, I love that. <laughs> Melissa, I, that would be an interesting one. I think that would be so cool to see um, the M&Ms characters as a gamified class. I think that would just be awesome. Uh, well, there's many different flavors nowadays, so, yeah. you know. That's so cool. <laughs> oh, that would be, that would be so neat. Um, and we'll, as we work through this here, I, I would love to see that kind of emerge as a, as a theme and a concept um, as you go through us. Uh, welcome to everybody who's, who's joining us here. I see quite a few more um, who are kind of making it uh, into the chat. That is so, so awesome uh, that this many people are excited about it. Uh, Secret Agents, uh, Josh mentioned his, uh, Harry Potter, Insects, Plants. Um, uh, positive virus. I'm not, I'm not quite certain what the reference there on that one. <laughs> Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing right now is huge. Yes, uh, absolutely. Oh. I was just kind of thinking like the virus is going around negatively. Oh, okay. But it's kindness or, you know, a positive switch to our world right now. Yeah, those are great. And being uh, contagious. <laughs> That would be awesome. Uh, yes, we, we definitely need more of that um, in the world, uh, without a doubt. So if we can make a, a kindness game, that would be awesome to see, yeah. Um, detectives, these are some great, great ideas. And so that's kind of the things I, I want you to kind of think about with this when you think about theme is, it, is if you're passionate about it, the kids will be passionate about it. I promise you they will. But if you're not that passionate about it, making it a, a game is gonna be tough because if you don't like it, the kids aren't gonna like it. They can read you and they know that. My kids know I love Indiana Jones. Like it's not hidden in any way. Um, and so that helps them kind of see the benefits of what we're trying to do and the way we create it. So theme is where we start, but theme is, is only part of it. Um, you know, if all you have is a theme, that's great. You might have some really cool decorations and a really neat and bright and inviting classroom but if that's it, it, it's not much. So we need to kind of think about other things we can bring into that. And so one of the things we can think about is setting. Um, and so when we think of setting, we've got to think about the fact that our theme can't live just in this nebulous world. It's got to have an actual world that it lives in. And the best part about this is it doesn't necessarily have to be a year long thing. Um, if you're somebody who wants to do that, that's great. I love that. I'm an, a, an all jump in kind of person, but, um, if you wanna be more kind of, well, I just wanna use it for this unit, or if I just wanna use it for maybe this lesson, that's okay too. That's absolutely okay too. 
Um, so don't feel like you have to have everything thought out all the way. But um, And things change as the game goes on. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. But if you think of setting, so setting is changing the terminology of your classroom. So if you were, say, setting up in a Wild West theme for your classroom, then it can't be, oh, hey, a student's asking for a pass to go to the bathroom. It's, hey, I'm asking for a pass to go to the outhouse, you know, or I need to go to, you know, the watering hole to go refill my water bottle. That kind of terminology uh, needs to be a part of it. And I will admit, as, as, as a gamification guy, that's where I struggle the most, is coming up with those, that terminology to help keep that in the forefront and, it, and reinforcing that with students. So when you think about your theme, think about those, that bit of terminology that you can put into it, into that setting uh, as you go through it. Um, so, you know, um, if you're say Harry Potter, obviously you've got spells are a big part of this here. Um, locations within Hogwarts castle or other, you know, schools uh, of witchcraft and witch wizardry that you need to look at. All of those are elements that, that get into uh, setting as we go. And I think that's really kind of cool um, to see um, when you start to bring that uh, into it. Uh, the best part about it for you, kind of on a, on a personal note, is that if you love it and you need to kind of, oh, I need to refresh my memory about this, you get to spend time either reading the Harry Potter books or watching the movies or you know, watching Indiana Jones or whatever it is that you're, that you're doing. If it's Star Wars, you've got a whole universe, you've got Marvel, it's a whole universe that you can look at. And the best part about it is no significant other can judge you for sitting on the couch watching that. Because then if they say, you're just sitting there watching movies, like, no, I'm not, I'm researching. I'm researching for my game. That, that's the whole goal here uh, as we go. And so I'm building in ideas as we go. I mean, um, Jordan Billings uh, teaches over at Indian Trail and he, in Olathe, and he has a whole Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. set up for his. So he's watched the Marvel movies. He's pulled all of this information together um, to create villains, to create uh, other storylines within it. And because you have this universe to pull from, you're not having to create a lot of it from scratch. Although if you want to create it from scratch, I think that's awesome too. Um, I know Josh um, created a lot of his from scratch. It's just kind of himself and these various villains that all seem to look like him amazingly. Uh, and he, he's welcome to kind of share a little bit about that uh, as we go. Yeah, so uh, my villain is my evil twin. His name's Dr. Von Stock. Uh, he has an eye patch. Uh, so, uh, and it's an evil. <laughs> It's an evil pirate eye patch. Um, so obviously he's evil. And then all of my secret agents in my game also look exactly like me. He, they just wear a suit and tie. Um, and that, it's one of those things that you have to commit though. Like I, I will never let the kids know that I am not, I mean, Dr. Von Stock is my evil twin. When they ask me how many siblings I have, I say I have uh, three brothers and a sister. One of them is Dr. Von Stock. So, I mean, everything I do, I, I commit to that. So. Um, but that made it easier for me because if I added a new character, I just dress in a new costume and it, it just made it simpler for me instead of having to um, come up with something new. each. Yeah. Um, so like when I do it um, as Indiana Jones, uh, I'm, I work with this idea that and this is the plan for next year. Um, and it was I was working on it this year is they start at, if you look at the Indiana Jones films, they start with there's always him finishing whatever his previous adventure was. Um, and so that first day. Uh, we do like a squad challenge. So there, there's some kind of competition for review of content that the students are doing. And I'm dressed in the full, you know, hat, jacket and satchel setup. But the very next day, when we finish that review, we're launching into a new unit. Well, the next thing Indiana Jones does is you see him in, uh, in his classroom lecturing. Well, I'm not lecturing uh, to the students at all. I have, um, I use John Meehan's QR break-ins. But what I do is I start off with it. Oh, hey, this is going to be a lecture. And then all of a sudden there's some like mysterious message that appears in the slides. It's like, oh, wait, we're on a new adventure. And all of a sudden the students go and they're exploring content as we go through that. So it adds that kind of layer of mystery uh, with it. And so I kind of use that character as my basis um, as we go, even though I look nothing like Indiana Jones, I, I will freely admit that. I wish I, wish I had the chiseled jaw of Harrison Ford, but I, but I don't um, at all. So I kind of have to embody the character and make them call me Indiana Jones as, as we go, or Dr. Jones. That's that. The best part about it for kids is uh, I get that question a lot from kids. They'll say, hey, when is Dr. Jones coming back to talk to us? You know, it, it's a strange question to get, but it's always kind of a fun element that shows me that they're engaged. So when you think about setting, setting is all about kind of the terminology of it. But you need to remember, as, as Josh and I just kind of talked about, um, 
it can't be a ghost town. If you've created a universe and have no characters in it, that's kind of boring. Your, your students need some kind of person to interact with. Now that might be interacting with other players, or it could be characters that you've created as well. So I use a lot of the Indiana Jones canon villains, although I'm trying to create some of my own as we go to flesh it out a little bit more. But when you create those villains and those characters for them to interact with, a boss to battle, or somebody who's gonna give them a clue or give them some information uh, to help them along the way, now you're creating an immersive experience where they feel like they're embodying a world. Um, and the world may not exist every single day. Um, you may, it may be, hey, we're going to, you know, have a, have a day within our universe that, you know, each dedicate Fridays maybe to, to that or, or Mondays or whatever it is we're going to dedicate that day to really be immersed into the world and have activities centered around it. And the rest of the time is the world exists and they're earning experience points and items, but it's not like directly uh, applied that particular day. But think about the characters that you could bring into it. So if you've got Harry Potter, obviously you have a built-in villain, or if you have Star Wars or Star Trek or anything, you have built-in villains as you go. But you also have other non-playing characters, just people who exist that might offer support. So sometimes when I hide a fortune and glory quest, they've got a, students have to realize on the website I built that, oh, that's a picture, it's probably clickable, and I click on that person and it's an image of a character from the films who's gonna offer them advice uh, or suggestions or say, hey, there's this extra mission that you can do. So that's part of it too. So you got to think about characters that could be within your world. Um, but I think probably the best place to start when it comes to characters is always with villains. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second too. There's a lot to kind of unpack here. Um, and then action. What are the characters doing? Like what are your players trying to do? So mine, um, the premise of it is, is that our main villain um, has recruited a bunch of henchmen to go back in time and steal rare antiquities from the past and alter the future of the United States. So for example, when we study the constitution, this person was an intruder at the constitutional convention, stole James Madison's notes, and now we don't know actually what the constitution is supposed to have in it. So that means my students, when they go back through this, oh wait, we've got to recover James Madison's notes. That's the action they're doing. But to do that, they've got to study the constitution. And so what they're doing is they're actually learning the content and the skills we need and addressing our standards, while at the same time, I can create an item that says James Madison's notes that unlocks some special ability. Um, so in this case, the item James Madison's notes allows students to use my notebook on a uh, quiz, you know, for a certain length of time as we go. Uh, so it might be like, hey, you get to look at my notes for a minute before you take a quiz. That's kind of a fun way of uh, approaching that. Um, so uh, I know that kind of goes kind of quick uh, through it. I would love to answer kind of questions you guys have. I wanted to kind of keep this open to discuss gamification. If you have thoughts about kind of how I do things or how others do things, we can absolutely share a lot of ideas. Wow, um, I, I love the number of people who joined us. Um, so fire away. Uh, yeah, I can share a link uh, um, real quick. We had a question about, um, about can I share a link to that here? Uh, let me uh, pull up my screen here real fast and kind of show you what I've got here. Um, and kind of pulling this up here. All right, so it's gonna share my screen here uh, for you and I'm gonna pull open um, what I do on a regular basis so I can show you kind of a leaderboard here. So um, this is a leaderboard, it's, a, it's just simply a Google Sheet. Uh, if you want access to this, I will tell you the person to uh, go to is mrmatera.com. Michael Matera wrote Explore Like a Pirate um, and he uh, kind of is the guru of gamification. If you need to talk to anybody about gamification, he's the guy. Um, but he shares a lot. He's got a YouTube channel. He shares so many things about gamification. He has a podcast called Well Played. But his uh, spreadsheet uh, took him about 2,000 hours worth of coding to make it work. But he sells it for like 25, 30 bucks. Um, I don't have 2,000 hours or the coding experience, but I do have 25, 30 dollars. So I bought it, uh, access to it, and it and it walks you through the whole thing. Um, and this is what the students see for a leaderboard every time. Uh, when we check the leaderboard and you can see kind of where everybody finished this year uh, on that. 
But what the actual whole thing looks like is uh, this. I'll kind of go here, control panel here, real quick, um, as this kind of loads up uh, for us. And this is kind of where everything works through. Um, the best part about it is if you seem, oh my gosh, this seems overwhelming, he actually has uh, the directions. And on the directions, there are uh, Vimeo links for everything, for how it all works. So um, mrmatera.com, if you're wanting to build a spreadsheet uh, and a leaderboard and handle badges and experience points and all of that, he walks you through the whole thing about how to set it up. It's actually really, really user-friendly uh, to go through. Uh, someone else asked for a link of kind of some of the things I do. So uh, yeah, let me uh, pull open um, kind of where I house everything and we'll go that way with this. Let me. All right, so this is my website uh, that I built. It's just a Google Sites page. Um, it takes a little while to kind of go through everything, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time with it, but long story short, if you hit press start, this is every unit that we uh, use in the year. And everything in here is uh, set up. This is some of the initial stuff about rules, expectations, team building stuff that we do, all of that uh, as we go. Um, and so I'll put this link in the description for you um, with it so you can kind of see where everything's at uh, with that. So there's the link to it. It is now in the chat so that you can see that. But uh, as students go through it, they navigate this uh, site as we go. So if we look at the constitution aspect, um, I offer an adventure path, uh, which if you have questions about that, I can absolutely share it. But the whole thing is kind of immersive. And so here we've got uh, an assignment and sources listed for them. And the whole thing is set up for them to be immersed into it as we go. And when they complete it, they um, submit an assignment and we complete our task and they move on. And then they uh, go through this and then this would be a particular boss battle as we go. And it gives them a uh, setup for uh, that. It's just a Google form is all that boss battle is that they submit and I can see whether they did it and it's just simply a quiz and it gives me a chance to see how they're doing things as they go. But it's all linked for them and that they can uh, move through as we approach it. Let me see if I can find a one here for you that'll maybe uh, kind of set things a little bit uh, as we go. A lot of these are kind of linked to my Google Classroom so I don't want to necessarily uh, want to pull those up but uh, here we go. So this is their reform movement analysis mission. We got a lot of questions here going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was uh, this whole setup I give them the rubric what questions they need to answer and how they approach it as we go but this is kind of how they get a mission it's just simply a google slide and when they go through it um, at the end of it I go through and I assess their um, performance but when I go to the leaderboard itself this part right here has no reflection on their grade. It's informed by it to a degree, but it's definitely not a reflection of their grade itself. So if I go to here and I show this to students, you could not tell from the XP what someone's grade is in any way, which makes it public. I can make it public for them. If it was directly tied to their grade, that would be a problem because that's, reflect, that's a student privacy issue. In this case, because you could earn experience points through badges, through uh, incredibly creative work, which is why I love uh, gamification aspect on all of that um, as we go. Because I, you know, creativity is not necessarily something that's part of our standards, but if I can tie creativity into it and award experience points, badges, and items because of how creative and epic they were, that frees me up uh, to recognize those achievements. Uh, for those students. Um, so we got a few um, kind of questions out here and I love that some people are responding as we go as I try to go through this. Um, so uh, I will say on digital badging, um, there is a, as Ariel noticed that there is a Flipgrid topic um, specifically uh, out there on that. Uh, thanks Ariel for sharing that. But um, I don't award badges or items digitally. I actually award them uh, physically. I, I print off um, cards for them um, in the uh, resources, in the, uh, the grid session topics, I've, I've put a link to that 
there's a, um, a website called uh, MT, MTG cardsmith.com. Um, it's a place for creating custom Magic the Gathering cards, but you could modify it to fit your classroom. And that's where I create them. And that's how I hand out items. So it says what abilities they have to be, what level they need to be at uh, to use it. And I talk kids through kind of how this whole system works um, as we go. And that really helps them to kind of see the value of it. Basically for me, an item is, what do you want to do in class? So, hey, I want to be able to eat a snack in class. Okay, I'll create an item that allows you to do that. But you got to show me through your work that you can do it. That, that you're epic and legendary and that you've earned that right or that privilege. Um, my building has a pod area just outside my room. Hey, I wanna use the pod to uh, work. So, okay, there's an item that allows you that privilege or man, I forgot something, I need to go back to my locker. There's an item that allows you to do that. Uh, and that's the best part about it. And you don't have to make them unlimited use. Uh, you can make them limited use. I have some of them that you can only use three times and then the item is used up. But the best part about it is that if you create something that's limited use, you also create something that is unlimited use because you can create another item that's unlimited. Um, can I share something about that too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so my wife actually designed a whole bunch of cards for our kids, uh, my own kids, uh, while they're doing this work from home and they're earning dollars each day that they can buy cards for. And like, we have one that's four tires and if they get all four tires, then we're going to go uh, buy them lunch and bring it back. Um, but there's all kinds of items like earning additional mo house money. Um, but they can also, earn, I got, I can't speak too loud cause they might hear some of the, they don't <laughs> know what the cards are yet. Um, they can earn things like, um, my son just got one that he's supposed to make his bed every morning, but with this card, he doesn't have to make his bed that day. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, forgive me if I'm not uh, getting everybody's name right because we've got some people under some some pseudonyms and, and some uh, handles and that's okay. Um, we had a question about um, from uh, Sackowick. Uh, have you ever had anyone completely buck the game? How did you handle that? I kind of tell my students that you don't have to participate in the game to do well in my class. Um, I have a completely standards-based grading class, but and so you can do well in my class without being uber creative. You could literally respond uh, to every question in there in a Google Doc and turn that in. And some, oh yeah, hey, you definitely demonstrated that you that you know how to that you know this material, but I always tell kids you are going to have so little fun in class if that's all you do. Um, so the engagement aspect with it. The other thing I would encourage you to do with that is, if it's an individual, partnering them into a group that is absolutely tied to, hey, I want my group at the top of the leaderboard. That makes a big difference because that positive peer pressure can really start to influence kids to get more done. I've watched that happen. Uh, kids who would say, oh, I'm not gonna do that. And then they get with a partner who's like, no, you're gonna pull your weight because I don't wanna lose out on a chance to move up the leaderboard from this. So that's absolutely a way um, to do that as you go. Um, the other thing to think about too, is some of those kids who wanna buck the system on it, they actually can sometimes be your best players. They can be what are sometimes referred to as griefers in a game where they find the back doors through a game and they discover, oh, hey, you didn't say we couldn't do this, so I'm gonna do that. And you realize, oh man, I should probably change that about my game, or no, that's actually really cool. Um, this year I had students who, they wanted to be able to trade items. I didn't have that set up in my game in any way. So they developed their own currency. They, they took, okay, so if you have to be level five to use this item, that means it's worth five level one items. And they started trading outside of class for their items. And then they came to me and said, hey, we created the system. Can I trade in with you for all of this? And so I was like, oh, I didn't say you couldn't. So I, I guess you can. But I think, okay, we're going to put some restrictions on it. And they kind of designed the whole system for it. So it's something I want to include next year. I think that's a great uh, way to go about it. So tapping into their like mischievous side or, hey, I don't want to be a part of this because I don't want to see, I don't want to treat this like it's really cool can sometimes spin it around towards your advantage. Um, so um, uh, Calliope asked, uh, had, has anyone had experience with uh, building themes with student input or does the immersion of the world work better when you come up with it and they discover it? My general experience is that students will certainly help um, kind of help craft it. But again, if you're not passionate about it, they're not gonna be hooked on it. So that's kind of an element to think about. 
feel like I'm dominating the conversation. So I, I want to leave time for people to think it. Kids are also really good at cutting, coming out with items. That's one thing I always struggled with. Um, so I tend to rely on them pretty heavily on, well, what, what kind of item would you like? Um, and then they'll point things out as year goes on as, as they pick up on it, they're like, Oh man, I really hate it when this happens. Can we have a card for that? And so they, they are really good at coming up with those things. That's when I ask for the most feedback is the things that I have a hard time coming up with. I turn it over to the kids. Yeah, that is awesome, Josh. I, I love that. Yeah. I've done that as well. When I start running out of ideas, I'm like, what do you want to work for? What are you willing to do? Um, this year, the big thing was, I want to be able to listen to music in class. So I created a structure um, for that. I had about three or four different items for kids who wanted to be able to listen to music while they worked. Um, and and they, they worked for it. I, we had a lot of kids who really uh, uh, tried on that. Uh, Amy asked a question about, besides picking a theme, uh, what is one simple suggestion for someone who's never tried gamification? I think the simplest suggestion you can offer, um, yeah, Josh just shared out, Dice is a great one. Um, boss battles, um, and Jennifer just shared that as well. Convert your quizzes into boss battles. Um, literally just, all you have to do is just project an image of a villain up there and say, this is how many health points they have. This is how many health points each of you individually has. And we're going to start asking questions. I did it with just simply a Jeopardy game that I had. And I just said, hey, you got to battle the boss. And for each quest, you get like three health points. And I just used poker chips for it and said, each of you has three poker chips. So if I ask you a question and you get it wrong, you lose a health point. If you get it right, you get to roll a die and see how much damage you do to the boss. And there's, a, there's ways you can also incorporate people who, players who die, the fallen, uh, can get back into it. Um, where if someone misses a question, then it goes to the fallen. And if the fallen get it wrong, everybody in the class loses a health point. So it keeps them engaged too. So if they lose, so if they die, like, oh, I don't have to do anything. No, 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 you still have to be a part of this. And the rest of the class wants you to get the answer right. And so there becomes a collaborative competition element to it. And you avoid a lot of the Jeopardy effect where kids say, oh, well, there's no possible way I can win. So why should I keep trying? Um, Jennifer says she used closed pins instead of poker chips. That works too. Um, you know, it's amazing to watch uh, with dice kids just get that sheer like look of excitement slash panic when they're rolling a die and they know what can happen uh, if they roll a certain number or below a certain number. Um, and dice are easy to find. Um, I think I found one at Barnes and Noble that was a bag that literally is a pound of just different types of die from 20 sided all the way down to six sided and you just buy it and, and you have it for you. you got something to say. Oh. oh, okay. So I was going to jump in. Um, so I started, doing this, just like adding games into the classroom before I really started gamifying everything. And I teach juniors. And one of the things that I did is like, one day I said, okay, before tomorrow, your assignment is to uh, come up with five questions from the previous chapter. It was the Great Gatsby. They each had to come up with five questions that they thought no one else in the room could answer. So not only did they pick through that chapter with a fine tooth comb, which is, I mean, I just wanted them to read it for Pete's sake. Most of them wouldn't read it, but, but they knew something was coming up um, because I, I said that. And then the next day they came in, they, they had, I gave them clothespins. They each had the clothespins. And this is an idea from, uh, I think John Meehan's book, um, something that, something clothespin bumper cars, clothespin bumper cars. So then they've got their paper with the five questions. They've got their three clothespins and they get up, they get, get into the pool. They're going around bumping into each other and they have to ask a friend a question. If the friend can't get it, they get a clothespin. If the friend gets it, they high five and they move on. And then once you lose your clothespins, you're, you know, you're dead. You're, back in the you know out of the pool um, but you can get back in if you ask the teacher and stump the teacher you can get an extra clothespin that's so that was something that I added on the fly for kids that were like well what do we do now so that was no preparation on my part except that I had a bunch of clothespins so that's an idea for those of you that want to get started in a very easy way and I have kids who are in points for their teams and so one thing I did is I had five stations around the room. 
And for each station they completed, they actually earned um, one of the numbers on the dice. So if I complete station one, I get the number one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, up to five. And so then at the end of the hour, I had them, um, however many numbers they got, that was their safe number. And then I rolled a giant dice. And if it rolled on your number, you got points for your team. If it got uh, a number that you did not have that was safe, you actually had a consequence. And for this activity, um, I think it might've been when we were doing Mount Everest. And so they actually got frostbite on one of their hands. And for the rest of the day, they couldn't use that hand. And so it was just at, at, taking what I was already doing. I was already gonna do these stations anyway. And it just added dice makes it like a element of chance to it because you never want that kid who's going to dominate the entire game and nobody has a chance. So I always make sure that there's some way that the person who did about half the work could still like come from behind and win because that keeps them engaged in it. And it just adds this other layer of anything could happen. And you are the only one that knows the rules to your game. So you can make stuff up as you go. Yeah, I, I would absolutely echo that uh, from Josh. Uh, don't worry about it if, if the game doesn't seem fair. Games aren't necessarily fair, um, you know, as, as we go. I, the great example, um, Sydney mentioned this idea of like Mario Kart's balloon pop. Mario Kart is absolutely one of the most unfair games ever if you are in the lead. It absolutely is. Because if you're in the lead in Mario Kart, you get the worst power-ups. But if you're in the last place, you get the best ones. Why? Because they want people to keep playing. So the game in itself is inherently unfair. Um, our content can't be, our curriculum can't be, the, what we are teaching cannot be, and the way we obviously treat students can't be. But the game itself doesn't necessarily have to be this perfectly think, fair world where everybody gets X, Y, and Z. The experience becomes customizable. And so as you add items into your game and privileges, the, the whole experience is customized to the player. What do they want? What are they willing to work for? Um, I put limits on how many cards, like, kids can have. So I have uh, trading card sleeves and uh, we cut it down to a two by two trading card sleeve so they can only carry six items. So they can stack them one behind the other, except for where their uh, level badge um, is. I'm going to share something here in a second that will kind of maybe show that uh, out. Um, they, so when they do that, they only have six items, but then I have another item that gives them like a one by three section of the uh, trading card sleeve so they can gain six more spaces. So essentially when you create an item, think of what rules you have in your classroom or rules in the game, and then create an item that allows you to break the rules. And that's how you start to build it out. And you don't have to have everything figured out all the way. If this seems overwhelming, I understand. It was overwhelming the first time I did it. Um, my game was terrible my first year and it's gotten better each time because I learned some of these little things along the way. Um, so uh, the link uh, is to my uh, game manual. Uh, that I provide for students. Um, and I can kind of show you uh, that as well. I'll share my screen here so you guys can see uh, what I'm looking at here. Um, so this is modeled after Nintendo Power. Um, again, that's kind of my, my nerdiness here. But it, it literally lays out everything um, as we go. Uh, it has the class rules um, as we go, um, kind of how I do standards-based grading, et cetera, the standards we look at, the levels available to you, what each world is gonna be, what adventure path is there, um, what rare antiquity is there to recover as we go, um, kind of what the items do. So this is kind of what the trading card sleeve thing looks like. This is their level card. Um, it always goes in that corner and then they can stack these uh, too deep. Um, so if, you, if they're full, you have to give up an item. So now you've got to think about, all right, which one do I want to give up? Which one is not important to me? So if you're a kid who doesn't care about using the pod, well, then you give up that item and you get a different one um, as we go. And so these are just some of the basic items uh, that they have as we go. And like I said, I linked it so you can see it a little bit more detail um, as we go. How the badges work. Um, they have XP immediately as well as hidden XP at the end of the game. Um, how you can earn some really special badges as we go. Um, these kinds of elements, the characters and then the world bosses, uh, all of it is set up for them to kind of walk through the whole thing. What's it take to, to win? About four different ways to win the game um, as we go through it. So it's a really neat uh, way to do it. And I'm always trying to edit this and update this for students. So if you have the link uh, to it, um, 
just make a copy of it if you want to create your own or if you uh, just want to be able to view it as we go i edit it um, each year to try to make it a little bit more uh, user friendly for the kids um, yeah, Josh, I will definitely post that uh, in the resources uh, page uh, as uh, when I get to that point on here. Um, so yeah, it, it, yeah, as Jennifer said, the game lets students take risks that cannot affect their grade. It makes them think outside the box. And I think that's the important thing to think about is that they are on that adventure. And when you change it to that and you change the way you talk about learning uh, with kids, it becomes a much more meaningful thing. So students know in my class, don't ask me if this, is this for a grade? How many points is this worth? I don't answer that question. I, I actually just walk away. And it forces them to start asking the right questions. Um, this gets in a little bit more to standards-based grading, but I have students who will ask that. And then they start to figure out the question to ask me is, how can I make this better? Um, do you have an idea of how this could be maybe more epic uh, as we go? I always tell kids, I dare you to be epic and legendary. I dare you to do it. Um, so there's a wall of fame for people who've achieved that. I keep those things um, from year to year. Uh, there's an all-time uh, leaderboard uh, that I can show with you guys. I know I keep jumping back to sharing screens and everything um, with you, but uh, I can. So if we go to the start page here, there's a link to the strategy guide, which is that game manual, and then the records room. And so in the records room, it has the uh, all time top 30 as well as the top 30 from each year. Um, how many XP they earned, where they finished in the standings as we go. Um, and so every year we'll have their own uh, setup in there. And then we'll, uh, and I will update this um, each year as we go. So as you can see, like last year um, was, was Erica who knocked it out of the park. I mean, her, I don't, it's gonna to be tough for anybody to top that number. <laughs> she was that epic, but that's kind of how, how we go about it uh, when, we, when we talk about it. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how, how we approach that. Uh, other questions, uh, feel free to type them or, or, or if you wanna raise your hand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who was in charge of snacks for this meeting? Um, I, I will admit, I, I broke down. I, I was missing my Chipotle, so I went and got Chipotle for lunch um, earlier today. Um, so I didn't have snacks uh, today. I've had enough for, for right now uh, before dinner. I like that. I mean, I, I guess I have my Zevia here that I haven't like opened. I just kind of popped that there. But um. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I appreciate the, the, the shout out on the, on the epicness of the site. It, it took some time. It's a, definitely a labor of love. It, it keeps changing as we go. Um, every year you kind of tweak it and, and that's the cool thing. Um, yes, <laughs> Amy, you're going to start somewhere. Okay. Um, I, that, that's great. Um, Amy knows where to find me. She can just go hunt me down and <laughs> figure those things out. Um, so uh, I know we've been yeah, going here for about 45 minutes and I felt like I've done so much talking and I've, I always want to open it up to all of you for, for thoughts. Uh, not sure how the M&M science adventure would go. Um, it would go amazing. That's how yeah, it would go. Yes, absolutely. Would. If you are passionate about M&Ms, it, it would definitely go amazing. I think of, um, oh my gosh. I mean, I would almost think like each different flavor of M&M has, is a character in your game. Um, and, you know, the, uh, you could almost invent a villain in, in, in kind of the style of, of like Gargamel from the Smurfs, but maybe not that exact same character as their job is to devour all the M&Ms. And so your student's job is to save each M&M. So each unit you do has a different M&M they're trying to save uh, as they go. And maybe each one gives them their own little like bonus. So if they've did a really awesome job and they rescued this M and M, that gives them this special little bonus um, that they can use. Ooh, yeah, uh, Jenica sharing that out about Candyland. I like that idea as, as the setting uh, 
for the M&Ms. That, that's a good, good thought. And uh, that's, a, that's a deep call back to, <laughs> to board games, Candyland. I like that. Um, kids would eat their characters <laughs> as we go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> also a shout out to um, explore the XP lab chat um, is on Tuesday nights at nine o'clock. And that's where a bunch of us get together on Twitter and do a Twitter chat. Um, usually one person hosts and then we discuss stuff like this. Um, so every Tuesday at nine o'clock, um, although I forgot the past couple of weeks because I don't know what day it is anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would absolutely echo that. XP Lab is one of the best communities out there on Twitter. They are just so rich and, and giving of, of anything that you can possibly imagine. Some of the uh, people who are big on that are absolutely linked in the uh, gamification resources. Um, the uh, well played podcast is a good place to learn from too. If you like podcasts, uh, each one's about 30 minutes long um, and you have a lot of um, cool things here. Uh, Melissa, it's um, hashtag uh, XPLAP. Who is the elementary teacher that always posts things? Is it Carol? Yeah. Um, Carol, what, what's her last name? Carol McLaughlin. Um, yes. Miss Mac 100. She is phenomenal, especially if you're elementary. Um, she has an amazing gamified class. Mm -hmm. uh, she does one, uh, if you are um, for elementary level, uh, Jamie Halsey does a whole Star Wars theme about building where the kids are, um, they can, as they earn different elements, they can construct their own lightsaber and they get their picture taken with their lightsaber. Um, she's also got it set up now for this year that they were allowed to choose a path to be either uh, light side or dark side of the force. So some of those kids who like to mess with uh, other kids or like to mess with the game, they can choose to be on the dark side, which is a neat um, setup. Uh, that is a good, uh, that's a good point. Um, winning the game. I, I always get asked about this. What do kids get out of it? Why do they, why do they do it? And the thing about it is uh, in my class, literally, if you reach level 11, which is obtainer of rare antiquities, you get your picture taken uh, in my, in Indiana Jones's hat, jacket, and satchel. I use a filter to make it look like an old timey photo. I put it in just a wood frame. I found at target for like a couple bucks and I hang it on the wall. And that's the reward. I print off a certificate that tells them how many badges they earned and what adventure paths they completed uh, and all of that. But that's it. That's all they get out of it and, and the status of being in there. But, you know, reaching level 11 is just one way to win the game. There's other ways to win it. There's also other ways to leave a legacy. I tell kids all the time, you can be in the all time top 30. So for some kids you are like, I don't know that I'm ever going to reach level 11 and I've got a lot of other things I'm involved in, but I want to be in the top 30. They push themselves to get there. Or others are just like, I just want to be in my year's top 30. Okay, that's great. That'll, that leaves a legacy. And others are, <clears throat> excuse me, are just like, they want to be uh, just in front of their friend. I, hey, I just want to beat my friend. I want to finish in the game higher than my friend. Um, and yeah, and as Jennifer just pointed out, some kids just want to imagine themselves as a hero. The best comment I ever got from a student about it came from uh, Erica last year. She was in my class and she mentioned that she started doing the fortune and glory quests, which are side quests. And I'll mention that in a second because she was done with the work in class and wanted something to do. Then when she realized how fast she could move up the leaderboard doing them, her exact words out of her mouth, the next one part were, I'm not a sports person, but I can win at social studies. And I was like, that's what I want. That's the mentality uh, that you want to have. And why do games work? Because kids keep playing the same level over and over and over again to do it perfect. So if instead of that level, what if it was your content? We would want them to keep going over and over and over again to, until they got it right, until it was as perfect as it possibly could be. And that's the, that's the whole goal uh, behind it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the beauty part uh, of it. So I mentioned fortune and glory quests. Uh, the generic term for these are what are called side quests. Uh, I call them fortune and glory quests because of course, Indiana Jones, but a, a side quest has no impact on their grade. There is no extra credit in my class. Um, so it doesn't move, improve their grade in any way. It can only move them up the leaderboard. Some of them have special items that can only be earned on those quests. Some of them have special badges that can really only be earned by doing that quest. But it's just usually, it, it's all of that stuff that we wish we had time for that we don't. Uh, a prime example, I, 
So living in Kansas, I have this strange kind of interest in the 19th century whaling industry. It's a strange kind of focus of mine, but we don't get to talk about whaling um, because we're in Kansas and no one's going to talk about whaling in Kansas. But the story of the whale ship Essex is one of my favorite stories. So what did I do? I just made it a quest, a side quest, a fortune and glory quest. They, I said, hey, research the story of the whale ship Essex and make a complete and accurate map of their journey from Nantucket all the way to their return. That was it. Those are the only instructions. How you did it was up to you. Um, some kids turned in a very basic map. Others really went into detail and plotted each kind of key day of the journey. I, and kids dove deep into it. And the kids who really dove deep into it and earned the item that went with it discovered something because the item allowed them to eat food in class. Well, they discovered that the reason it allowed them to eat food in class is, and the connection to what they learned was, they realized, oh wait, that's because the first mate, after he died, they found that he had been hoarding food in his attic because he had, they had had to resort to cannibalism to survive, if you don't know the story. Spoiler alert, sorry. Um, read the book, it's, it's worth it. But they, they connected content to this little piece of cardstock. That was all it was. But they, they had that connection and they had that experience and they had that joy of learning for the sake of learning. Um, it is, it is, yes, absolutely. As Josh mentioned, it is absolutely great for um, cross-curricular elements. Um, yeah, it, that's the time to, to bring those things together. Um, so when you think about side quests, think about those things that you wish you could teach, but just don't have time for, or are those standards like, oh, that's that topic that I loved teaching, but with this shift, we're probably never going to be able to get to it again. Build it in as that side quest. You'd be amazed at how many kids will challenge themselves just to take it on. Um, I have one where students have to, they have to research the history of the Delta Blues and 12 Bar Blues, and they have to write a Delta Blues song about life for African Americans in the South after the Civil War. So they have to research a musical connection, they have to do a little bit of history research, and they have to produce something original uh, in terms of artwork. Well, that, that's epic. That's, that's legendary if you do that right. So it's, it's some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, <laughs> Jennifer said extra credit is lame anyway. I, I, I love that. Um, that is a great, great, uh, great comment. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you've got to run and you want to talk more there, I've got another session at 10 AM tomorrow and another one at 9 AM on Sunday. Uh, and I will happily talk about this, um, till, till the cows come home. It, it, it absolutely will. Um, as I mentioned, Josh knows I could go on for hours. Um, Josh and I, uh, along with Jordan Billings have spent more than one occasion at, at a coffee place talking <laughs> gamification. So uh, there's there's also a really great episode of the Aletha Spark Starters podcast where we all sit around and talk about it. If you're looking for a good podcast to listen to, shameless plug. <laughs> yes, ab absolutely. Yes, the, the Aletha Spark Starters podcast. And now I'm jealous because I don't have my shirt there. I never bothered to pick that up from from Andrea. Um, <laughs> I need to I need to send her an email. Um, yeah, I'm so glad that you guys have en have enjoyed uh, this. Um, like I mentioned, that we have a couple who, have, uh, who are you know, student teachers or, or student interns. I think that's, that's awesome that they joined us uh, for this. I, I tell you, it, it can be overwhelming um, initially, but without a doubt, gamification really revolutionizes the way you view your content. You have fun designing it, and when you have fun, the kids are having fun. And that is such a, such a fun um, element to, to teaching, and it's what we, we live for. Um, I'm sorry, Angie, I didn't mean to make your head <laughs> spin uh, so much. <laughs> um, any questions kind of here? We've got, we've got a few minutes left here. I didn't want to take up everybody's time. I know some people have some things that they need to get to, and I'll stay on if people have some questions they want to ask in a smaller one. <laughs> the exorcist would not be a good thing. No, 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 no. We do not need a vomiting pea soup uh, in class. That, that is definitely not the, <laughs> the way we need to go. Um, with all of that. Yeah, that, that, mm -hmm. no, I, some, somehow I don't know that the public schools are, are going to look kindly on, on an exorcism being performed <laughs> in class. Um, 
to be fair, I did record a video for my game in a, we did a ghost hunt at Missouri State Penitentiary and we were, I needed video for my game. And so it was like 2 a.m. We're in the basement of this abandoned prison on this ghost hunt. And I'm like, okay, this looks like Dr. Von Stock's dungeon. And so I said, okay, guys, don't judge me. Thankfully, they were all teachers or, or spouses of teachers. And so I'm running through this prison at two o'clock in the morning going, they're after me, they're after me, <laughs> screaming and like ducking into corners. And yeah, my wife can vouch for that. Um, yeah, it, it was it was interesting. <laughs> I, I, wow, that, I love that uh, idea. I, I will admit, I, I finally had to break down and uh, buy myself a green screen setup. I'm waiting for that to come in from Amazon so I can uh, redo some of my flipped uh, videos in, in character and, and incorporate some of that. Because um, my flipped videos are, are a little out of date. I've, I've used them for too many years now. But um, yeah, it, it, that, that's, this is such the fun part of it is you, you get to have this joy. And I will tell you, it is a lot of work on the front end. I, I, it is a lot of work to build on the front end. But here's what I'll tell you. The back end work where you get to go around and have conversations with students about their learning and you get to see them engaged and loving what they're doing makes it worth it. And you have to think about you're going to be spending that kind of time anyway. You're going to spend that time somewhere. So you can spend it on that back end, planning out lectures, dealing with behavior management issues and, and kids not engaged with content, or you can spend it on the front end being real intentional about what you've done. And then you don't have to do that stuff on the back end. Your kids are excited to be in class. You've provided an experience for them that they'll remember. Um, and not every kid is going to love games. Not every kid is you. I mean, you want to try to hit everybody as much as you can, but you know, you're going to have some kids who, who may not get engaged with the game and that is okay. If you've designed it well and your classroom well that they can still experience success in learning, even if they don't play the game, you'll start to hook them in. You'll have kids, they'll realize, oh, that was kind of cool. I got to do that. Um, you know, I had kids last year who, who were like that. They weren't kind of really engaged until about the third quarter or so. And then they got into it. Like, oh my gosh, this is so, so cool. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it, it, when it's good pedagogy, uh, you get to use it year after year and, and you can just make little tweaks at, as you go uh, with it. That, that's kind of a neat thing. Yes, when they get to be the hero and put their team over the top, that is so, so neat uh, to see. Um, you know, last year we did a uh, recreation of the Oklahoma land rush where they had to build a homestead. And I gave them just a Ziploc bag full of a set amount of Legos, a piece of twine and Play-Doh and said, you need to build a homestead. Your homestead needs to have these elements to it. But depending on which homestead property they got to first, it depended on how hard or soft the, the Play-Doh was in order to build with. So they had to realize the, that some property wasn't as good as others. And as they did all of that and they built that and they perfected their homestead and they had to present the little homestead proof of form to me and sign it and get all of these things done, we got to the end and I asked the kids, did you have fun today? And we were gonna do a review and, and a reflection piece on it the next day and a writing piece, I asked him, did you have fun today? And pretty much every kid said, yeah, we had fun. And the ones that didn't said, oh, we didn't have much fun. The rest of the class looked back at them, like seriously. And I said, you got to play with Legos and Play-Doh today in social studies and you're in eighth grade, you had fun today. And they will get hooked into it. Their classmates kind of provide that element to it, the ones that really get into it. So that, that's kind of the joy of it. All right, so Jim had to head off. Um, so does uh, Mr. Greenfield. Um, yeah. Well, fire away questions. Um, don't, don't hesitate to, to ask. I, I, I know I keep saying this. I feel like I talk way, way too much. Absolutely. Uh, Elizabeth here. De nada. And if anybody's interested, there is a, uh, what's the next one? Seesaw session starting at one o'clock um if anybody's interested in that one two sorry two o'clock two o'clock yeah 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 absolutely yeah seesaws um talking about that um all those things i'm excited about what uh that's all gonna bring all right <laughs> looks like some few people here are kind of heading out um but if you have questions, feel free to, to stick around. I'll, I'll gladly answer any questions if you were kind of concerned or anything. 
Um, like I said, a couple more sessions to go uh, tomorrow and Sunday. So if you want more, we can do it. Yeah, I'm really curious to look at, I want to make my, I haven't done a manual like you did. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of my goals for the summer. Um, that was awesome. I, I, I like what you did with the, and, and then the leaderboard that you continued from year to year. That was really cool too. Yeah, um, that, that really wasn't too difficult. Honestly, that's just a mm -hmm. Google slide um, yeah. I just created. And then the manual was that too. I just changed the manual to be in, um, I changed the, the page setup to eight and a half by 11. So if I ever wanted to print it out on like glossy paper and have it be like a Nintendo Power. <laughs> yeah, that, I like that part too. Yeah, that, that would be kind of cool. So, all right, man. Well, hey, thanks for joining. Thanks yep. for and everything. No, this was good. You did a really good job. I really enjoyed it. Cool. Awesome. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. All right. Bye.